talking about you know being uh dipped and freshly dipped and all that type of stuff so as a kid how and why and when did you kind of develop your own fashion sense and, and include that in the lyrics oh man i say sixth grade is when i started caring about whenever fat laces were out so sixth grade i think for me was uh 85 86 so maybe a little bit before that maybe fifth grade or something like that whenever fat laces run dmc was 1983 Right, their first record 80, was like 82, 83. 83. Yeah. So maybe 84 then is when I just started caring, you know, wearing the. the You're talking about fat laces in the Adidas or in the Pumas or both or something I else. I couldn't afford either of those. It was fat laces and whatever shoes I had. I, I couldn't get the shoes, but I could get the laces, you know? So I remember I had some neon orange ones that I used to rock. I think there were some suede Nikes, but I never could get the Puma Clydes. I couldn't get the Adidas, you know, like I didn't grow up with, with I think I had some kangaroos. You know, I was a little kid too, though. So kangaroos and I think some some blue Nike suede Nikes. They were like, you know, bargain bin Nikes. Like my mom used to get my shoes from the grocery store. You know, like they used to have a box with mm-hmm. a bin, and you know, they'd be connected by a little piece of plastic. You know, like I'm from the kung fu slippers and and that type of stuff. Like, so I think after that, I started caring. I remember sixth grade. I started having a more preppy style, you know, that was when, you know, aha, take on me, all that kind of stuff was really big, Duran Duran and all that. So I remember you were the man, if you could get, there's an Esprit outlet out here, right? And they had these shirts that only the staff could wear, but they sold them sometimes. It said Esprit really big, you know, normally Esprit didn't have a lot of uh, fanfare on it. And I guess it was anything foreign, right? So Benetton, Esprit, anything that was from elsewhere exotic in our in our mind was cool but i'll say between so fourth to sixth grade is when i started really caring about my my fits like i remember senior year not senior year sixth grade gra- when we were graduating like it was all about bugle boy genera mm-hmm. uh espadrilles i remember wearing espadrilles no socks everybody was either crockett or tubs all the all the white guys were crockett all the black dudes were, were tubs you know the miami bikes <laughs> yeah. and it, you know but from then on it really i cared that being said my finances were not in a space where I could really be as fresh as I would like to be. You know, I remember going to junior high school with the kangaroos with the fat laces and being almost, you know, like being ridiculed because guys had Ewings by then, you know, and top tens and all that kind of stuff. So had to work with what I had. I also have um, all female cousins. So my handy hand-me-downs would be like pink and stuff. So, but I, I, I kind of roll with that, you know, okay. It matches my swatch, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, I, I can, I can do this, you know, but, yeah. So fourth grade started being aware of it just because of, I think, break in and all that stuff. Right. And then I say by sixth grade, really caring. And then it just sort of blossomed from there. Like by by high school, we was boosting and doing all whatever we could to get get fitted, you know? Yeah. And at this time, too, with what was going on with the Bay, when 93 Infinity would let them know you guys have the two short scratch in on there, which I always a loved but also thought it was uh surprising to me given as i was coming to learn about you guys but i also knew from afar about the bay being so diverse and all the different things so what was it about short that you guys didn't make music like him but you wanted to embrace him and and shout him out i guess by scratching him on let him know oh man too short is like he's like you know grandmaster kaz or or you know uh you know, like he's the, the alpha rapper from here, right? He he was the person that made us understand, like, oh, you can rap. It's not just, it's not just um, New Yorkers that can rap. Like, you can rap. Look, I do it. I'm from here, so we definitely wanted to start the. That was purposeful, starting the record off with his voice. You know what I'm saying? Like, look, this is how this is where it all started. As far as not making music like him, we don't want to make music like anybody. You know what I mean? Like Dale's cousin is Ice Cube. We didn't want to make music like N.W.A. either, not because of the subject matter, just they had a different sound you know like we i think we were in the whole jazz loop jazz sample fusion more fusion than jazz right uh samples and stuff like that but we weren't trying to sound like tribe or de la or anything like that you know that they, they, i think they sound very distinct from each other and from us so it was really trying to sound different than everybody i think our subject matter isn't really that different than too short you know it's like girls hanging out chilling you know 
I mean, even when you think about live and let live, it's like some, some more street vibe stuff or, you know, uh, well that I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, live and let live. I was, the thing about it is even with people that love rap or say they do and talk about rap a lot, I, I often wonder, do they actually really listen to the lyrics? Cause on there it's like robbery, it's gun. You guys got guns and you're robbing or defending yourself with guns. And it's just like, do people, are they listening to what you're actually saying? <laughs> like, no, I think they're looking at the outfits. They're listening to, uh, sort of the tenor and the, uh, how proper we sound and all that. And that, I think a lot of times we got caught, caught up in that kind of a lack of critical analysis of, of what we were doing. And I think maybe that affected us going into the second album. Like, yo, we, we're not like just some preppy kids from the suburbs. We're really from East Oakland. And we, you know, we would say that, you know, on the, on our, um, on our songs, like, yo, we're, we're from East Oakland. It gets, it's hectic out here. We, I'm going to show you how we chilling. I'm going to show you something different. But it's it's not something where uh, I think a lot of people, you know, people don't think critically about a lot of stuff, right? So it kind of it kind of is what it is. Like I can't be frustrated because I think people, a lot of people, look at stuff surface level. And those who did people lyrics, I think they realize like, oh, these guys are not all that they seem or all they look like. There, there, there's a different dimension to it, and I, and that's to me like. Part of the reason we had longevity too like we did we did tackle some tough topics i mean we think about what a good way to go out like gang, joining gangs and, and and robbing people and all that kind of stuff and i mean we really used to be on some like you know we used to really dabble a little bit but but not so much that um it became who we were or part of our uh identity it was just more so like i am dealing with limited resources let me see if i can catch this little gyps right quick and I'm, but I'm not about to go out every day and do it. But I mean, we got homies who did. That was what that's what they do. I mean, it, you know, we're 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 still in Oakland, so worse than it's ever been too. We're, we're, because the effects of gentrification is creating sort of this permanent underclass of um, you know, I mean, street people and and street and street shit. You know, yeah, for sure. Because even with live and let live, you're talking about gotta pull pieces because we're peaceless. Like that's a yeah, that's one of my yep. favorite favorite lines on the album man like it's crazy um yeah but that being said musically um i was intrigued because of there's a lot of horn usage on 93 to infinity there's living let lives got the piano there's these different things but i also didn't i never felt you guys were at least to me lumped in or heard my friends talk about you guys in the jazz category like a gangstar or a tribe do you know yeah do you know why you know people some people did some people didn't look at you those ways i always thought we were definitely lumped in with that i mean and it kind of was frustrating because i'm like i love guru i love tribe and everything but what we do is different and if you put our records together they're different i mean but even guru like guru ta tackled a lot of street topics even though stuff was was calm and everything i mean the crew he was rolling with was wild and they they they, they was tackling some street stuff too so i, I think we did get lumped in but because we have different accents, because of just the trajectory of our career, it's only a few people who sort of remember that time period that say, oh, we we're in this kind of movement. And then also, next record, I mean, it wasn't jazzy at all, right? It was a lot of uh, more uh, played beats and uh, um, fewer samples, et cetera. And I mean, that, that's, that was purposeful too. Like, okay, things are changing. Me personally, I feel like <laughs> No Man's Land, for me personally, has aged better than 93 Till Infinity. Not like, 93 Till is a classic, but it's a period piece. You know, and it, it's timeless, but it, but it, but it's timeless from a certain period. You know, to me, well, you listen to No Man's Land, and I'm like, the flows that we have, the styles that we have, the beat styles and all that is way more in keeping with what's going on now than 93 Till. 93 Till is definitely a record from 1993. Yes, I also agree, but I want to ask you this too, because as I was thinking about it and remembering some of the songs on No Man's Land, like You Don't Stop and For Sure, For Real, like some of those songs also were, um, I guess, percussion wise, much more laid back. And even if the sonics on 93 to Infinity, I all, always felt were more demonstrative, I guess would be a word. Whereas <laughs> those two songs and some of No Man's Land, the music was more muted i guess you would say or not as loud per se uh, 
Okay. Yeah. I think we were trying to go for more, more trunk, right? More, more bottom. More, more bottom. More people playing us in cars and stuff like that than necessarily. I think ninety three till is more of a headphones record, right? And that, and that probably has to do with the fact that we was kids. We didn't have cars, you know. Like I got probably had my first car when we went to record ninety three till. So we wanted something that people could ride to, you know. And that doesn't mean it has to be dangerous music, you know. Ant Banks, uh, you know. That 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 kind of knock, but something that you know you think about you don't stop and it's like if you play you don't stop in the car loud it's slapping. There's nothing on ninety three till that's slapping like that. Nothing, not one song. You know, you mean you mean show for real? It's like it's mellow and cool, but you play for show for real next to ninety three till sonically for show for real is gonna be way more punchy. So I think I think the bottom the bottom mattered to us a little bit. Okay, now that makes sense, but it was always a. Uh... It was it was very striking sonically the difference. So I was always kind of curious as to where that came from. I think it came from if you listen to every one of our records, except maybe there's only now where we're purposefully trying to create a 1994 vibe, right? As far as just this not sample selection because there aren't any samples, but stylistically, right? I think all of our records are very different. If you go from you know. No Man's Land to Trilogy, hella different. Then, you know, the Trilogy to Montezuma, hella different. And then Montezuma to, to, to uh, There's Only Now, and maybe it's like a full circle. Uh, turn, turn back to, to the essence. But uh, I think our goal is to not make the same record twice. Like, I don't want to make a 2023 till infinity. You know, right. that's, a, that's not an album. I'm not trying to do a sequel record or anything like that. Me personally, maybe, you know, in our group, we might have, uh, uh, nah. I mean, you listen to High Rose catalog, every record is different. You listen to every casual record is different. I don't want to say it's, pro- it's a, it may not be a progression. They're just going in different directions each time. And and to me, that's because style has a temporal, temporal component to it, right? Style is from a time. You think about a zoot suit, okay, you think about the 20s or something like that, right? You think about a shark skin suit, you think about the 60s. You think about, uh, you know, big cartoon Astro Boy boots and, you know, wide leg suit. You think about 2023, right? So there, there's a there's a um, temporal aspect to style. And so we always try to lean into what's going on at the time, not in current events, sonic. You know, we, we try to lean into what's going on at the time. Not saying like right now, I would make, I guess Trap is old too at this point. But right now we're trying to make a lo-fi record. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that what am I going through? How do I want music to make me feel? How do I want my music to make other people feel? That's what I'm going for on this record right now. You know, and that, and I think that if you look at the time periods for each one of those records dropping, hopefully they'll be different from everybody else's that's out, but hopefully they'll be different from, I mean, they're representative of what we were going through at the time, sonically. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, Bob, on your MTV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.